So um, this is the beginning of uh, session number six, entitled Thrilling Pleasures. And our first speaker is uh, Adam Kozashka. I managed to pronounce his name well because he told me how to pronounce it. Um, who received his doctorate from Syracuse University, New York State in the US and is currently visiting assistant professor of the humanities at Texas A&M International University. He studies literature and law in the 18th and 19th centuries, especially the relationships between legal and literary concepts of character. His work on this uh, topic is forthcoming in two articles in the um, European Romantic Review, and he is currently working on a monograph. We don't know which monograph exactly, but uh, anyway, he will tell us. His work on other topics can be found in the uh, Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts, the Bernie Journal, and in two critical collections. So, Adam. Thank you, and, and also now over uh, to forthcoming you. In, in Studies in Romanticism as well. Okay. But, but thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll just, just get right into it. As Stuart Kelly has observed, linking Scott and Stevenson is not an original idea, but precious little has been done with the figure that bridges the chronological gap between the two authors, Henry Coburn. Passing away in the year after Stevenson's birth, Coburn wrote memorials of his time in the 1830s and its continuation shortly before his death. Both were published posthumously and chronicle life, law, politics, education, architecture, and culture in Edinburgh from the last decade of the 18th century up until the late 1840s, right before, in other words, the 1860s and 70s that Jenny Calder says were so very disappointing to the young Stevenson for their unromantic qualities. When Stevenson began aware of Hermiston, he wrote to his friend Charles Baxter and requested a copy of Coburn's memorials. It is unsurprising that more has not been done with tracing memorials as a source for some of the most vibrant content in Ware's first five chapters. Coburn's memoir is never treated by scholars as a literary work, and the few studies that delve into it with any detail tend to receive it as an accurate primary source that chronicles a series of major historical changes in Edinburgh over the first half of the 19th century. Most often examined is Coburn's attention to changes in architecture, preservation, and urban planning. It is my contention, uh, in an article that does not mention Stevenson and is forthcoming in the winter 2022 issue of Studies in Romanticism, that I invite you all to read, uh, that Coburn's Memorials is a literary text that borrows representational strategies, especially in its use of previously circulating legal anecdotes, from Walter Scott's Waverly novels. If, in Colin Kidd's words, Scott's romantic Tory patriotism was qualified by his sociological Whiggism, or in Calder's, that the Waverly novels invested the future with a Whig view of amelioration, though Scott believed that Toryism was the proper guardian of the past, then Coburn achieved the opposite version of a similar blend. Politically, Coburn was an outspoken Whig reformer who is credited, together with Francis Jeffrey, for extending the Reform Act to Scotland in the 1830s. Aesthetically, he reveled in Tory nostalgia as he romanticized the outward trappings of the very institutions he fought so hard to reform. The pre-reform Scots law and its associated professional culture are foremost among these. Now, I may be the first person since the last decade of the 19th century to have read Ware of Hermiston for the first time after I had read Coburn's Memorials. Uh, and it was strikingly obvious that Stevenson had used this jurist's mem memoir to construct many of the scenes and characters in the novel's first five chapters. Sidney Colvin's essay on Ware's unfinishedness uh, devotes a few sentences to Coburn's influence. Ian Duncan, like myself more properly a Scots scholar, includes Coburn's name as one entry in a long list of potential sources behind Ware. If I am permitted to indulge in a notes and queries-like project, then I will trace more connections from memorials to Ware than I have thus far been able to find in extant scholarship. But my purpose is not to make a Roman Lafay argument, rather to claim that Stevenson's use of Coburn's memorials has bearing on the historical form on how the historical form manifests in where. Stevenson's reliance on a highly literary piece of life writing that was itself influenced by Scott's fictions produced a kind of meta-historical form for which literary shifts in genre from the legal narrative of 
bustling Edinburgh to the windswept hills of the borders, generated historical shifts in period from the 18th century to the Romantic era. In the process, all three stops along the lineage I explore here from Scott to Coburn to Stevenson generate excitement and pleasure for readers in the unlikeliest place, uh, the legal system, uh, which at any rate Stevenson found somewhat boring, um, by implicitly and sometimes even explicitly exerting that the present, where less is possible, is boring, while the past, where more is possible, is exciting. This is actually something that we get in the historical forms in Scott. This logic obtains in memorials where Coburn introduces his larger-than-life character sketch of Robert McQueen, Lord Braxfield, the historical personage directly identified by Stevenson as the basis for Adam Ware of Hermiston, with the things that he did and said every day are beginning to be incredible in this correct and flat age. In a passage that Colvin picks up on when writing about Ware, Coburn caricatures Braxfield, who is strong-built and dark, with rough eyebrows, powerful eyes, threatening lips, and a low, growling voice. He was like a formidable blacksmith. His accent and dialect were exaggerated scotch. Coburn then gives us famous Braxfieldisms. My, my sincere apologies, but I have to do it. Um, come awa, Maester Horner, come awa, and help us to hang ain of the damned scoundrels. I almost want to show you what this looks like on the page. It's hard to find something this exaggerated, even in the Waverly novels, and it is certainly more on the nose than anything Stevenson himself includes in Ware. This gives the lie to Stevenson's detractors. Uh, here's a quote from Duncan. Some of Stevenson's early critics complained that he had overdone the Scots dialect, betraying the act of pastiche with this stylistic excess. Certainly the speeches of Adam Weir or Kirsty Elliott are over-egged by comparison with the renditions of Lowland Scots by the great masters of the period in which the tale is set, James Hogg and John Galt, as well as Scott himself. If we believe Coburn, this over-egged quality was the fault of Braxfield himself and not of Stevenson's fictional Adam Weir, uh, the most famous Braxfieldism is rumored to have been set at Joseph Gerald's uh, 1793 sedition trial where Braxfield presided when Gerald defended his radicalism and added that all great men had been reformers, even our savior himself. Muckle he made of that, chucks, chuckled Braxfield in an under voice. He was hang it. This is directly from Coburn's memorials. Though Robert Osborne, Braxfield's late 20th century biographer and defender, claims that these words were never spoken by the judge, they certainly circulated as if they had been. And there is no doubt in my mind that where of Hermiston's line that so offends Archie at the trial of Duncan Jopp, I have been the means under God of hanging a great number, but never just such a disjasket rascal as yourself, delivered with what the narrator tells us was the savage pleasure of the speaker in his task, is Stevenson's deliberate attempt to create his own Braxfieldism. The same is true when Ware's narrator notes that the man was mostly silent. When he spoke at all, it was to speak of the things of this world, always in a worldly spirit, often in language that the child had been schooled to think coarse, and sometimes with words that he knew to be sins in themselves. Uh, the, the best one in Ware is, what do I want with a Christian family? I want Christian broth. Give me a lass that can plain boil a potato if she was a hur off the streets. You can hear, by the way, how much less exaggerated these are than Coburn's actual Braxfield quotes. Uh, Coburn, though he sternly condemns Braxfield in his era, calling the 18th century an age of coarseness, where swearing and drunkenness were very prevalent, if not universal, among the whole upper ranks, entertains readers with just such stories. In one of them, Braxfield loudly damns a lady for bad play at whist, and then apologizes by saying that he must have mistaken her for his wife. I don't think that these clear and obvious examples of Stevenson applying Coburn's descriptions and anecdotes of Braxfield to his own Adam Ware entirely discount arguments like Hasler's psychoanalytic one that Adam Weir represents Slavoj Zizek's notion of the obscene father who generates recondite pleasures by blending the authority uh, with the grotesque and irreverent. Uh, certainly Coburn says nothing's about Brax nothing about Braxfield's children and Stevenson's choice to use this exaggerated historical personage as the novel's father figure. Coulter's claim, however, that Scott used real evidence of the past and drew on the ballads he collected while Stevenson's Scottish fictions were based entirely on his own imagination is inaccurate. Uh, Stevenson's borrowing from Coburn's anecdotal history is quite direct and obvious. Sidney Colver Colvin observes that Braxfield's is an extreme case of 18th century manners, as he himself was an 18th century personage. 
and that for the date in which the story is cast, 1814, such manners are somewhat of an anachronism. During the generation contemporary with the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, a great softening had taken place in Scottish manners generally, and those in the bar and bench not the least. Colvin then cites John Gibson Lockhart's Peter's letter, Letters to His Kinsfolk as proof. Since the death of Lord Justice Clerk McQueen of Braxfield, the whole exterior of judicial deportment has been quite altered. Colvin is right that Braxfieldisms in 1814 would have been anachronistic, but let's not forget that Coburn did not enter the Faculty of Ad Advocates until 1800, one year after Braxfield's death. Much of his Braxfield stories then were secondhand, gleaned from those among Braxfield's contemporaries who had lived into the first decade of the 19th century. These are some of the most colorful sketches and memorials, the descriptions of, an of and anecdotes about the 15 superannuated Tory jurists who ran the court of session. Coburn singles these judges out precisely for their anachronism and goes into detail describing Lord Herman's outdated fashion sense. Um, I believe that George Ferguson, Lord Herman, Enlightenment philosopher Adam Ferguson's brother, is Stevenson's foundation for Archie's friend and mentor, Lord Glenalmond. Here's Stevenson's description. Lord Glenalmond was tall and emaciated, with long features and long delicate hands. He was often compared with the statue of Forbes of Culloden, his appearance as of an aristocrat in rude company. This one quote doesn't do justice to the beautiful gentleness and grace of the old judge who appears in wear as a symbol of a past era. Now here's Coburn on Herman's dress for society, the style of which he stuck to almost as firmly as he did to his principles, reminded us of the olden time when trousers would have insulted any company and braces were deemed an impeachment of nature. Neither the disclosure of the long neck by the narrow bit of muslin stock, nor the outbreak of linen between the upper and nether garments, nor the short coat sleeves with a consequent length of bare wrist could hide his being one of the aristocracy. The articles rough and strange would of themselves have attracted notice in a museum. What could be more agrestic and picturesque? Adam Weir's hard drinking, he was, besides, a mighty toper. He could sit at wine until the day dawned and pass directly from the, bench, from the table to the bench with a steady hand and a clear head. Beyond the third bottle, he showed the plebeian in a larger print. The low, gross accent, the low, foul mirth grew broader and commoner. Is my last note or query. Coburn's memorials has much of the 18th century, much on the 18th century lawyer's alcohol consumption. They had always wine and biscuits on the bench. The modern judges, those I mean who were made after 1800, never gave in to this. But with those of the preceding generation, some of who lasted several years after 1800, it was quite common. Hermond, in fact, identified by Coburn as the greatest drinker of them all, lasted until 1826. Coburn has many humorous anecdotes of alcoholic excess, even one in which he, Jeffrey, and some other young Whigs tried to drink with the Tory jurists at their anti madam club. But observe that Coburn is talking about those of the preceding generation, some of whom lasted several years after 1800. Not only does this complicate Colvin's conclusion that Adam Ware is an anachronism, it also speaks to what is generally accepted, what is a generally accepted principle of Marxist history, from Hegel's necessary anachronism to Marx's own Ungleichzeitigkeit to Frederick Jameson's sedimentation. The idea is that not everyone in a given historical moment will perfectly exhibit the spirit of the age called the dominant ideology by Raymond Williams. Some instead exhibit residual ideologies that were dominant in an earlier age, and others exhibit emergent, ide emergent ones that will someday be dominant in the teleology that is Marxist history. We know this from reading Scott. Any theoretically sound historical novel contains characters, institutions, and customs from multiple historical eras, as all doing battle, as it were. This is more or less true in real life as well, and so Stevenson's careful reading of Coburn produces the historical form precisely by introducing these anachronistic figures. This observation bids us re-examine Ware's organization and structure. Between the unfinished novel and the vague plan for its completion, we have three, possibly four, distinct segments. Uh, first, the five-chapter Edinburgh set tale of law and filial rebellion. Second, the folksy and ballad-driven love story set in the romantic, windswept Hermiston. Third, a return to the legal setting when Archie is placed on trial for Frank's murder. I say possibly four segments because it is unclear if the murder itself or Frank's being forcibly freed from prison by Kirsty's brothers, what in Scott is called Highland Bail, uh, would have been its own distinct segment. 
By segment, I mean not only a thematic and plot-based subdivision of the story, but also a compartment with generic and historical significance. To clarify by example, the first segment tells a tale of post-Enlightenment Edinburgh, to borrow a phrase from Duncan's book on Scott, that revels in the caricature-like representation of essentially 18th century legal professionals. I call this setting an essentially 18th century one not only because of what I just said about anachronism, uh, but also because of another characteristic of historical novels. Authors write what they know and what their sources tell them, which is sometimes at odds with the historical, historical periods they have chosen. John Sutherland reads Scott's Red Gauntlet, which identifies itself as set in the year 1765 as more accurately being set in the 1790s, or at least the novel's legal scenes featuring Alan Fairford, the young attorney, show Edinburgh's legal profession as it was in the 1790s, when Scott himself was studying law, um, and not as it was in the mid-1760s. Uh, Coburn's description of the first two decades of the 19th century is laden with 18th century characters and 18th century institutions. This was part of Coburn's project. He was a reformer, and so he was drawing attention to all of the 18th century's remainders, which he politically and morally condemned, while nevertheless presenting them as more exciting than anything he associated with, in his words, our correct and flat age. He was also a huge Scott fan, despite their political differences, and his descriptive toolbox unsurprisingly inclined toward romantic descriptions of the past. Whether intentionally or not, then, Stevenson's choice to set a story in a Coburn-derived early 19th century results in a story rife with 18th century elements. If we follow this logic, Ware's second segment presents an entirely different historical period, the romantic era invoked by the lover's tale set in the windswept borders and anchored by the ballad and legend-heavy narrative, uh, together with what has been called the proto-postmodern inclusion of Scott himself as a minor character. Archie writes loose, galloping octosyllables in the vein of Scott, and Kirsty's poetically inclined brother, Dand, provides the ballad uh, Raid of Weary for Scott's minstrelsy of the Scottish border, which actually would have been published 12 years before Ware's 1814, and uh, which does actually contain a ballad with a similar title, The, Ware, the Raid of the Reed's Wire, um, in that same border ballad genre. Multiple scholars have co connected Kirsty's brothers, each to a different trend or even historical personage in romantic Scotland. Ware's move then from Edinburgh to the borders is a move from the 18th to the early 19th century. One of the ways in which historical novels from Scott to Stevenson to the early 21st century apply Scottish Enlightenment stadialism is by equating travel through space with travel through time. Logic still obtains today. I live about 10 miles away from the US-Mexico border, and when my students go to Mexico to visit their families, they will inevitably tell some kind of story about going back in time. Uh, of course, they mean the visibility of extreme poverty um, or the relative absence of advanced technology and medicine, communication, etc. But they also mean the relative lawlessness and violence of cartel-controlled northern Mexico. This violence to law historical sliding scale is ubiquitous in the historical forms representations of justice. Scott says this quite directly in Waverly's first chapter, where lawsuits in our era play the same role as violence did in the past. In Rob Roy, as in other Waverly novels, the further north one travels, the further back in time one goes. We have a segment in a highly litigious Glasgow where the characterful Bailey, Bailey Nickel Jarvie knows his way around the modern law, and then a segment in the Highlands uh, where Helen McGregor's autocratic mode of justice commands her clan to pitch a man off of a cliff to his death because she believes him to be guilty of betrayal. And kidnapped, we get this in the Jacobite havens of the far north where Rob Roy's son is wanted on multiple criminal charges but can move freely without fear of legal consequences. That, in where, excuse me, the journey is from an 18th century metropolis to an early 19th century rural setting isn't particularly problematic. Let us recall the unfinished novel's segments. Archie goes from a litigious Edinburgh that confines and restricts his emergent anti-capital punishment ideology to a rural Hermiston where he is free to romantically roam until Frank the Mephistopheles out of his Edinburgh past comes to haunt him. Stevenson's plan for the novel then has him charged with murder by the anachronistic legal establishment he thought he escaped until Kirsty's brothers break him out of jail and he goes with Kirsty to disappear in the North American open spaces. In each case, the vector is away from the pre-reform Scots law that through Coburn's source material is represented as residual or dominant and into the open landscapes of Hermiston and the colonies that is represented as emergent, better suited to Archie's romantic character. Since I'm more or less out of time, let me just close with one example uh, with, with, um, with the presence of Scott in this text, right? Uh, that it's a sort of kind of metafictional strategy 
uh, that occurs, I mean, the, the fact that Scott gets mentioned several times in Aware of Hermiston, um, that actually occurs in each step of my object of study, right? The Scott Coburn Stevenson trajectory. So first, Scott was already doing this. Shakespeare and Spencer both make, make brief cameos in his Elizabethan novel, Kenilworth. Uh, second, though Coburn's memorials is generally, and I would say mistakenly, read as a non-fictional piece of life writing, it represents a vibrant cast of real people set off by the highly literary and subjective light of caricature. Memorials has much on Scott, but it is not the Scott we have come to know since Hazlitt and Lockhart cast him as an arch-conservative. Coburn justifies to his Whig self and to his Whig readers why he would continue to support and adore Scott, even in the extremities of the great unknown's conservatism. It was not, according to, Co uh, according to Coburn, Scott himself who held such caustically reactionary opinions, but rather a circle of unscrupulous journal journalists and attorneys who employed base means to trick the intelligent but overly idealistic Scott into supporting their causes. The worst, he says, of Scott was that he was thinking of feudal poetry, not of modern business, when involved in political debate. Coburn, a defense attorney for most of his career, presents Scott as a literary character, a genius with the street smarts of a mediocre hero, who isn't, to use uh, Lukács' term, right, who isn't responsible even for the darkest consequences of politics, uh, such as when a man was killed in a duel over you know, a, a periodical disagreement. So Coburn Scott is hardly the Scott that we have come to know or accuse, as Nicole Wright just did in her 2021 book, of noxious ideology. Then we have Weir of Hermiston, which gives new life to Coburn's caricatures of Braxfield and Herman, while introducing Scott as a background figure, linked to the novel's legal subject matter by naming him sheriff each time into the romantic rural setting of Hermiston, that the substance of the book's three references to Scott each have something to do with literature or, or balladry. So I have a little more, but I think I'm, I'm pretty much at the, at the point. So. Thank you so much.